Breaking data, Florida housing crash is ahead and recession is confirmed. If you're new to the channel, welcome aboard. My name is Chris Igo. If you're a returning viewer, I appreciate your participation in our journey. Now, before I get into the nitty gritty details of what's happening in the housing market, special shout out to the FAU Owls. Men's basketball team, final four, baby doing big things, getting stuff done, and we are going to be the Cinderella story of the tournament, and we're going to win it all. So go Owls, and woo! Hat hair, don't care. But let's get into it right now because there are a lot of things out there that must be addressed, and my suspicion is you didn't tune in to learn more about what's going on with FAU basketball. But fun fact, I did go to FAU way back in the day, and my children attend A.D. Henderson, which is on the FAU campus currently. So we are big OWL supporters, we are OWL alumni, and we couldn't be more fired up. Let's go! All right, let's get into the data right now. And I'd like to start with an article put out by Fortune on the 27th, which talks about a recession in 2023 is now inevitable. Layoffs in tech and finance will spread to other sectors. Well, welcome to the party, Murray Sabrin, who wrote this article. I've been talking about this for the last year. None of this is unexpected, and it's only starting to begin. Because the easiest way for corporations to restore profitability and to ensure their financial solvency is to trim the fat, is to lay off workers, is to reduce their payroll. And so far, it's been coming in drips and drabs. A thousand here, ten thousand there. But as capital becomes more pricey, and as lending standards become more restrictive, and the easy money is no longer available, it is 100% guaranteed that there are going to be mass layoffs as we go into 2023, 2024, and 2025. Has to happen. And to be clear, I'm not rooting for that to happen. That's not what I want to see. But I do know that in order for companies to be able to make it through the pain of recession, they're going to have to tighten up radically. And when they do so, a lot of folks are going to be looking, for, are going to be looking for new employment. And if those folks are the people who went out there and bought a home and manipulated the system to play the game, to get their debt to income, to look a certain way in order to qualify for a loan, well, chances are those folks are on the fringe of being in financial trouble, of starting to feel real financial pain. And as I mentioned before, the housing market and lending standards might be impeccable. The fundamentals may be intact, but the consumer is not. And the consumer has taken on more debt in the near term than in any other point in history. So there are a lot of folks out there that are living on the fringe financially that are borrowing from Peter, or should I say Visa, to pay Paul, or should I say Amex. But there's a lot of folks out there that are living above their means and are going to feel squeezed quickly. And I suspect they're going to make lots of other moves prior to selling their home, like selling their luxury watches or their luxury jewelry or whatever they have to sell in order to get liquidity. But if you're interested in knowing where the housing market prices are going to go, just look at what's happening in those other markets or what's going to happen in those other markets. Because those bubbles are going to burst. And as I've mentioned before, real estate is a lagging indicator of economic conditions. It's the last domino to fall. There are plenty of other markets that you can watch in order to glean what's very likely to happen at some point in the near future. And to be clear, this is not going to be applicable to everyone. There are plenty of folks out there that have the means, that have the financial standing in order to withstand anything that might happen in the near term and anything that might happen in the long term. And the truth is, if you bought a home today and you're financially solvent and secure in your financial future, if the market went to zero tomorrow, you didn't lose anything. 
But if you're forced to sell because you have to, well, then that's a totally different story. And I suspect that's likely what's going to play out in the relatively near future when the pain of recession gets worse and unemployment upticks significantly. And there's a lot of folks panicked, which is not the case today. Now, I hope you find this content valuable, and if you do, please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend, and please keep watching because I intend to cover the Orlando Kissimmee Sanford Metro at the end of this video. But it would be totally irresponsible of me to do that if I didn't talk about some of the things that are happening on a macro level first so that you've got reasonable guidance as to what is likely to happen in the future and absolutely what's unfolding right now. And now I'm not going to do a deep dive analysis into all of this article because a lot of it I've covered in the past, and I'll include the link below so you can read the story yourself. But one of the takeaways from this article that I thought was intriguing, I will share with you. And it starts right here, and it's under the 10-year treasury chart. Meanwhile, one of the best indicators of an impending recession is the inverted yield curve. And you've heard me talk about that before, particularly the difference between the 10-year Treasury note and the three-month T-bill. The curve inverted at the end of October 2022. Historically, when short-term rates rise above the long-term rate, a recession begins about a year later. And interestingly enough, when the yield curve inverted in 98, a recession did not follow until the curve inverted again in 2000, when the Fed tightened credit to deal with the dot-com bubble. And then he goes on to say that, in other words, there are exceptions to every rule. And that might be the biggest whopper of an understatement that I've heard in a really long time. Furthermore, the yield curve inverted in March 2019 when the Fed began to raise the Fed funds rate in response to what was perceived to be an overheated economy and robust financial markets. And the good folks at the Fed pivoted and the yield curve went positive after then-President Trump criticized the Fed for raising interest rates before the 2020 election. And for those of you who follow politics, and for those of you who have watched these things play out before, you know that every single president wants the Fed to keep the monetary spigot open and interest rates low to make sure the economy is humming when they seek another term. Because a bad economy is no bueno for being re-elected. Which brings us to 2020, 2-0. I got 2020 vision, in hindsight. But the massive monetary stimulus of 2020 to deal with the economy's implosion because of the lockdowns came home to roost in 2022. The Fed's unprecedented increase in its balance sheet from $3.8 trillion in early 2020 to $7.1 trillion by the end of 2022 provided the fuel to raise prices across the board. And with M2 money supply declining in recent months and the Fed continuing to shrink its balance sheet, effectively withdrawing liquidity from the economy, the question is, what effect will that have on prices, unemployment, and GDP? And if you've been watching for a while, you already know the answers because I've been sharing them for the last year. But this fortune rider is a little bit late to the party, but better late than never. As per the author, we are witnessing the beginning of increasing unemployment in the financial sector and high tech, which have benefited from the Fed's easy money policies since the Great Recession of 2008. And I'll link a video up above to my video that I did a few weeks ago called Layoffs Are Coming. Because layoffs are coming. But they've already happened. Recently, Goldman Sachs, which is a bellwether of Wall Street profitability and employment, announced layoffs of around 4,000 employees and cut their bonuses. If Goldman's announcement is a forerunner of 2023's Wall Street's downsizing, then the higher unemployment is unfolding in the canyon of lower Manhattan. And that will soon be in the rest of the country as 2023 unfolds. Because if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, unless you can't, and then you're totally screwed.
and Meta employees and Amazon employees are screwed. Recently, they announced another major downsizing of their workforces. If layoffs accelerate in the next few months, a recession, a readjustment to the end of the easy money policies of the past few years will be underway. And to be totally transparent, I can't read any more of this article. It is so old. It is so dated. That there's nothing in here that I haven't been talking about for a long time, so I don't want to bore you or myself. Now, if you've been watching for a while, you know that I'm a boots-on-the-ground operator of a high-performance real estate team. I am not an analyst. I'm not an economist. I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not Nostradamus. I don't have a crystal ball. And while I do have some experience as a 20-year veteran of being a financial services professional, and I've navigated almost every bad market and every crisis that we've ever experienced over the course of the last 20 years, my opinion is far from scientific, and while experienced, it's far from being pedigreed. So let's go right to the source, and let's hear what Roger Schiller has to say about home prices and what's happening in the market today. And if you're not familiar with who he is, you've probably heard of the index that he co-founded, which is the Case Schiller Index. And it's a great barometer to know what's happening in the housing market. Hiking 25 basis points at its last meeting, despite the recent bank failures of SVB and Signature. And as borrowing costs rise, what will the ripple effect be on residential and commercial real estate? Joining us now, Yale Professor of Economics, Robert Schiller. Professor, we're so happy to have you on the show today. Um, we're we're going to get a bevy of housing data this week, including Case Schiller Home Price Index tomorrow. Right. We have this brewing debate about whether we've seen a bottom or even at least a stabilization in the housing market. How do you see it? Well, I know they weren't asking me how I see it, but if you're interested in learning how I see it, I will include videos at the end of this one for you to check out because irrespective of whatever he's about to say, and truthfully, I haven't even listened to it yet, I know that the financial fundamentals of the consumer, of the homeowner, is the linchpin to every other market and all the things that will happen in the economy. And anything that he's going to say as it relates to the housing numbers that they're going to talk about or that are going to be released, you must understand that that is old news. That is not current. That is not forward-looking, unless he surprises me with some sort of prediction. But, but I know, because I can read and I have common sense and I'm experienced, that the consumer is in trouble. And that is no bueno for home prices in the future. Well, it's, it's uh, easy to forecast the short run in the housing market. Not so easy to forecast. If you're a long-term buyer, it's not clear. Uh, but home prices are, are very, very high and uh, by historical standards. Uh, I would extrapolate the downturn somewhat. Uh, it's going to continue. Uh, maybe if you have a chance to delay your purchase, it might be a good a good time to do it. Let me jump in here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And what I don't agree with is he can't extrapolate what the long-term prognosis is for the housing market. And while I'm no doctor or no doctorate or no PhD or no any of the titles that he is, I can tell you that the long-term trend for residential real estate over time is bullish. I know that over time, the market will do its thing, supply and demand will do its thing, and the population explosion will require homes and properties to live in. So if the free capital markets are allowed to do what they are supposed to do without government intervention, I can tell you that over time, the long-term prognosis is good. The short-term prognosis is no bueno, which begs the question, which he just said, should you buy now or wait? And that is 100% the right question to ask because everybody's needs are different. And there is no right answer. It's not what's right for me. It's what's right for you. So part of my onboarding process is when I meet with a new prospective client is I want to get total granularity into their financial picture. I want to understand what their financials are looking backward because obviously that's important in order to qualify for a loan if you're not paying cash. 
But I also want to know how secure are they in terms of future employment? How secure are they in their income? Are they set up the right way to be able to handle the financial obligation, or said differently, the financial burden that they are agreeing to? And if you're pushing the envelope and you're living on the fringe and your debt to income is too high and you're playing games to get into a house, then I would tell you, don't buy the house. You're probably far better off waiting. And I don't say that because I think the Florida housing markets are going to be on fire sale and you'll be able to get a half price home. I say that because you simply can't afford to purchase a home without radically diminishing your quality of life. And the U.S. housing market has already lost $2.3 trillion in equity over the near term. And I don't know what the future of South Florida real estate is going to look like. And while, yes, I'm on the record, is that we're going to see moderate single-digit appreciation into the future, I could be dead wrong. We could revert back to 2008 where there's 30 months of inventory and the percent of original list price received on homes in that time frame were 30% less than original list price. And those list prices were already low. So at some point in the future, you may have the opportunity to negotiate an incredible discount, which is far more favorable to your quality of life. But I'm no market timer, and I don't know that that's ever going to happen. The flip side of that coin is it doesn't happen. Instead, we see either single digit growth, the market's trading flat, or perhaps they go down a little bit. But if by waiting, you're putting yourself at risk for mortgage interest rates to skyrocket, the next time you reevaluate this situation, you could be looking at an 8, 9, 10% or higher mortgage interest rate, which again is yet to be determined. I don't know. It's not like I'm rooting for those things. But I do know if I had a time machine and I could go back in time and buy a home in Florida at 70s, 80s, 90s values and set it and forget it, and then check and see what it's worth in 30 or 40 years, I can guarantee you that number will have grown exponentially. Unless we really want to put on our tinfoil hats and say, well, the government's failing, and the yuan is going to be the new currency, and Russia's going to nuke Ukraine, and we're going to be fighting a world war on all fronts. And as terrifying as that thought is, I don't think that way. If any of those things happen, I can assure you the last thing you're going to be worried about is making your home payment. But I would encourage you to be prepared for any potential outcome that might happen. But for those looking to live their best life now and max out South Florida living to the fullest, that can afford to weather the storm of whatever might happen over the course of the next five to 10 years. I would say congratulations, welcome to living in Florida, and max out the utility of the home and live your best life now. Because as Andy Dufresne said in Shawshank Redemption, either get busy living or get busy dying. And I can assure you, I'm going to do the first option. But let's hear more about what Robert has to say, because I suspect he doesn't have much time left. Uh, you might get it a little cheaper after another six months. Hmm. Um... I want to shift gears a little bit because you're one of the founders, you're one of the fathers of behavioral economics. And I want to get your thoughts on the banking turmoil that we've seen over the past several weeks, what it's going to mean to future credit availability and just the role that behaviors, that attitudes have played in everything we've seen unfold. Like the wealth effect? Yeah. Uh, when I, in my book, Nar Narrative Economics, I talk about... Uh, narratives of, of regarding financial panics or bank runs. And th these were per perennial narratives in the 19th century. As the century wore on, they got stronger and stronger. I think, the, I think that, you know, that's what a bank run kind of helps. It helps if the narrative is that banks are endangered. I got to jump in here. So when I was younger, my mom told me, if everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you do it too? And the answer is no. That's the herd mentality. And if everyone is telling you to pull your money out of the bank, if the herd mentality is telling you to do one thing, it's probably beneficial for you to take a contrarian viewpoint and do the opposite. Now, 
I'm not telling you to bury your head in the sand. Of course, you must do your due diligence. And of course, you must make informed decisions. But the one thing you can never do is panic because panic begets more panic. And as people begin to panic and as people feel the pain of recession and as the cancer of that panic multiplies, I can assure you that every market is going to come down significantly. Now, he mentioned a 30% sell-off over the course of the next six months. I believe that's what he just said. Well, that's great. We're negotiating 20% discounts in our market right now on the right homes, with the right sellers, with the right buyers, if you're working with the right agent. But please make no mistake, you don't need to wait till any time in the future to negotiate the best deal right now, as long as you're able to negotiate the best deal right now. But what you must be 1000% certain of is that you are happy with that deal and you can handle the financial obligation that you are signing up for. And if you can, great news, you're good to go. Don't ever look at Zillow. Don't ever look at your home price. And when you go to sell in 30 years or your family inherits the asset, you will have added to their and your generational wealth. And contrary to what all the naysayers and some of the content creators out there are saying, all of that is bullshit. Get the best deal that you can afford, max out the home, live your best life, and know for certain you've done the right thing. And is it possible that at some point in the future, you may be able to get a better deal on a similar home? Yes. And there's a word for it. It's opportunity cost. But as I mentioned before, I'm never going to time the bottom of the market and I'm never going to time the top of the market, but I can certainly ensure you get the best deal now. But let's hear more about his red flags. Uh, and so eventually Congress in 1913 uh, had to put a stop to this. It, it, like people were so worried about their banks. So they, uh, they created the Federal Reserve. Uh, and, uh, but even the, you know, it's, we give the Fed a really tough problem, how, how to deal with this fundamentally psychological uh, uh, reaction to a, a, a narrative. Hmm. Robert, I want to go back to housing for a moment. How does this affordability standoff that we see in residential real estate end? I mean, we've got extremely low inventory, high interest rates. Is it gonna take higher unemployment to break landlords' ability to, to increase rents? And from there, the investments don't pencil out anymore and, and therefore they gotta dump them and, and you know inventory rises and prices drop or something else? Yeah. Well, that's uh, the capitalist system <laughs> with a central bank. Uh, I think it works pretty well most of the time. Uh, and uh, I, I, I wouldn't tinker too much with it. Uh, we have smart people on the Fed and the Treasury Secretary I admire, Janet Yellen. Uh, they, uh, they may have to accept, however, I think this is as uh, Jerome Powell has put it, they may have to accept something of a recession. But but uh, for the housing market, how should the people at home who are maybe thinking about selling a home, you kind of address thinking about buying a home, how should they expect this to play out? If you have a chance to sell your house now, even if it's for a little less than you wanted, do you go ahead and do it because you know higher inventories are inevitably coming? Uh, I wouldn't say inevitably. I would. Uh, I would say that it's likely to be some more decline so uh but i hate to you know uh home purchase is such a family decision i hate to uh overreact uh so we do have a declining market at the moment i gotta jump in here because his answer is terrible um so should you be thinking about selling your home and the answer to that question is only going to be answered by you what he did say and i do agree with is it is a family decision but at some point, the family decision becomes overridden by the financial health of the family. And if you've got visibility into your financial future, and that looks uncertain and challenged and likely to decline, well, then it makes a whole lot of sense to be in front of the tsunami of listings that will be coming to the market as pain of recession increases, as inflation 
continues to get worse. And more importantly, as unemployment and layoffs start to escalate. Because most people do not take action until they are in pain. And if you've got the wherewithal and the foresight to be able to strategize, game plan, and project, and be honest with yourself as to where you are right now and where you are likely to be in the future, it might be very prudent for you to tap out now, realize the equity, and get liquid. Because if you've been watching for a while and because if you've been watching for a while and checking out my housing market data reports for every housing market in Florida, the trend of supply upticking is inherent in every market in Florida. And that's during a time period where people still feel safe, secure, wealthy, and equity rich. When those dynamics change, when the psychology of the consumer and the market change, and everyone starts to feel that contagion panic, which he just referenced, I can assure you, you're not getting anywhere close to the equity today then. And while we specialize in finding the one buyer on planet Earth willing to pay more than anybody else, irrespective of market conditions, Market conditions play a major role in terms of you getting the most money for your home. So if it's something that you are concerned about and it's keeping you up at night and you can see the writing on the wall, then please reach out and let's have a conversation because the trepidation that you feel today will be utter panic a year, two years, three years, I don't know when, but when the pain of recession and unemployment go through the roof, you are no longer in the driver's seat. So far better to be proactive than reactive. And to be clear, I'm not trying to talk you into anything, but I am asking you to question yourself. I am asking you to do your own due diligence and audit yourself, audit your life, audit your finances, audit where you want to be in the future and see if it makes sense. And I pray to God that nobody in the future, a year, two years, three years from now, reaches out to me and says something along the lines of, I wish I would have known way back when. I wish somebody told me. Because I'm telling you right now, and I've been telling you for a year. And to be clear, I'm not rooting for it. I hope I'm wrong. All right, let's see what War Bonds has to say, and let's wrap this up. Oh, man. Uh, but, you know, there are costs to uh, not selling at the right time. <laughs> That convenient time, or you might lose a house that you liked uh, to somebody else. Uh, so I, I don't think it's an easy answer to that question. Hmm. And he's right. These are not easy questions to answer, but they are the hard questions that you must ask yourself in order to ensure that you are protected and insulated and prepared for whatever happens in the future. But enough about all of what might happen in the future. Let's see what's happening right now in the Orlando Kissimmee Metro so that you've got the best information in order to make the best decisions for yourself, for your family, and for your financial bottom line if you are thinking about buying or selling in the Orlando Metro. And away we go. This is February 2023, single family homes in Orlando, Kissimmee, Sanford, Metro which comprises the counties of Lake, Seminole, Orange, and Osceola. Now, to be clear, this is Central Florida. This is not a market that I serve or support, but I am very well connected with all-star professionals in these markets that can absolutely negotiate and advocate for you the right way if buying or selling is right for you. So, so if you'd like me to hook you up, please reach out directly and I'll get you connected right away. But here are the numbers. Closed sales in February down 23.8%. Let's call it 24. Cash sales down 38%. Median sales price up 5.3%. Single digit growth in February. I know we're in March. It'll be interesting to see what those numbers yield. They will not be out until April. Average sales price up almost 7%. Dollar volume took a big hit, but that's consistent with the fact that closed sales have fallen off a cliff. Median percent of original list price received down almost 4% to 96%. Well, 96% is not a big drop from 100, but the trend is not your friend. And the trend indicates to me that buyers have more options, they've got more leverage, and they're negotiating much better deals. And that's certainly been my experience here in the South Palm Beach County market. Time to contract up almost 400%. 
378% to be exact. It was nine days. It's now 43. That's a big jump. It's still a far cry from what it was in 2007, 2008, but the trend is not your friend. Median time to sale up 79%. It's 86 days. New pending sales down 12%. New listings down almost 21%. Pending inventory down 14%. Active listings, inventory on the market. This is your competition if you're thinking about selling. These are your choices if you're thinking about buying. That's up 122.6%. And month supply of inventory, which is the barometer of whether it's a buyer's or seller's market. February 2022, it was 0.7 months. It is now just under two, which is still a seller's market. However, this is the metro. The market that you're shopping in is going to trade very differently, and it is critical to work with a professional who understands the dynamics of the hyper-local market that you are shopping in, because the big picture is not what the micro picture is. Nonetheless, it's up 171%. Now let's check and see what our good friend Roger Schiller just talked about in terms of foreclosures and distressed sales. Well, are there any? That's what we want to know. And if you've been watching for a while, you, you know that distressed sales have really not been a thing in a long time throughout the totality of the state. But let's see what they are here in the Orlando, Kissimmee, Sanford metro. Whoa, we got two whoppers, my friends. Foreclosures, percent change year over year, up 70%, 70, damn near 100. That's a big jump exponentially. However, we're only talking about 17 versus 10. Still, it's not a big number. It's a big statistical jump, but 17 foreclosures is a blip on the radar. It doesn't move the market. And while I do suspect that number will continue to trend higher, for now, foreclosures, distress sales are a non-event in this metro. Short sales, big whammy, no whammy, no whammy. Nope, we got a whammy. It's up 200%. However, the number tells you that it's jumped from one to three. Three short sales in a gigantic metro is not a big deal. Up until it is. I'm going to flex my math muscle here because, again, I am an FAU alumni. There are 20 distress sales in this metro. 20 distress sales is nothing. 20 distress sales in this metro might as well be zero distress sales in this metro. And I don't mean that literally, but I do mean we must watch the trend. We must be aware of how it is growing. But the reality of it is 20 distressed sales in a market that had 2,100 closed sales is not a big deal, at least not as of February. We'll see what happens in March. Now, I hope you found this content valuable. And if you did, please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend, leave a comment down below. The engagement with the algorithm does wonders for me and for the channel. It helps me connect with people just like you, and I want to help everybody. And if there's anything I can ever do to help serve or support you at the highest level, please reach out directly because we'd love to help. And check out my next video because I suspect you will love it a lot. And until next time, peace. Go Owls.